This podcast is proudly brought to you by Paul's Strength Book, an app for everyone. For less than two dollars a day, you can have full access to weight training programs, nutrition, recipes, macro calculators, video library, and you can also track all of your metrics, including weight, measurements, strength, and performance. Search for Paul's Strength Book in all good app stores now. Hello and welcome to another edition of the Paul's Body Engineering Podcast. Today, still in India, uh, I thought I'd grab Joey Cantlin another time and have a chat about the space of online coaching and the fact that there is very much a misconception out there that online coaching is easy. It's uh, all bells and whistles. It's people sitting by a pool on their laptop with cocktails, which couldn't be further from the truth. So let's dive into that with Joey and break down some uh, misconceptions about the world of online coaching. Okay, well, we're back for another podcast. I've wrangled Joey in once again, given that um, we're all in India and he's basically got nowhere else to go. So <laughs> Take advantage. <laughs> I've taken full advantage of his, uh, his knowledge, shall we say. So it's a compliment, Joe. Um, <laughs> but this time around, like, the last podcast we did, we obviously spoke in detail about you know, champion athletes and, and what you see is a common trait or just general traits across the board to get people to obviously achieve great things. I thought we'd dive into the world of online coaching, given that uh, not only you know, do I do it, and I've been doing it for several years now, you've been doing it for, for over a decade, and um, you know, there's a, I think there's a very strong misconception out there regarding the fact that it's an easy job. Um, yes, you can travel with it, obviously, but it's not all uh, cocktails and you know, doing work by the pool and things like that. Like, as a prime example, I know you've been bunkered down for the last two days, probably doing check-ins for 12 to 14 hours straight while we've been over here. So um, let's let's just open it up for general discussion. But, um, you know, as I said, online coaching is certainly far from an easy job. Um, you know, what, what's your take on it just as a general overview to start with? Yeah, I think it's a... Um uh, it's it's hard to say. Like, it's very very challenging, but I also I would also say that, like I'm blessed to be able to do it because I think it it does give you a pretty large element of flexibility. Mm. But I think some people get that confused with it being easy. Yes, it's not just because it's flexible. It doesn't mean it's just easy breezy. Mm. You know, you're still dealing with real people, with real challenges, real issues, and real goals. Um, and if you're not on your P's and Q's, just like a face-to-face personal trainer, yeah. it's not going to work. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you might see you know some famous online coaches traveling the world and having cocktails by the pool and stuff, and they've probably got literally hundreds of clients. But how many of those clients that they actually are are they actually managing by themselves? Correct. Like they're probably managed by other people in the back end that people don't see, mm. and. You know, I know for a fact that some of those people do have other people that actually do their work for them and then they they just actually pay them. Mm. Um, I won't go into too much detail there though. Um, But yeah, it it is a challenging job, um, contrary to popular belief. And people don't usually realize that until they actually do it themselves. They're like, shit, this is actually quite challenging um, and it's quite demanding. And, uh, you know, we're not tradies. We don't go out in the sun for you know, eight to 12 hours a day and manual labor and stuff, but it's very, um, it takes a lot of emotional investment Mm. and a lot of time investment. And I think for me personally, the biggest challenge or the toughest thing for me as an online coach is the fact that you just, you never get to switch off. Mm. Um, People say, oh, you know, you've got to to set boundaries and this and that. And while, while I agree with that to a certain extent, I think there has to be some level of boundaries. Those boundaries are always going to get broken if you truly want to be a great online coach mm. and be there for your clients and try and separate yourself from a business perspective from others. You have to be doing, you have to be willing to do things that other people aren't willing to do, and that that goes for anything in life. Of course. But as an online coach, sometimes those barriers need to be broken. You know, you get a client message you at you know eight thirty nine p.m. Mm. Are you going to make them wait? You know, ten to twelve hours or 
you know, are you going to make your service better and say like, oh yeah, I can reply to that quickly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it, it comes with its own set of challenges and I think, yeah, there's, there's this misconception that it's, it's, that it's an easy breezy job. Like, like I said earlier, just because it allows flexibility, it doesn't mean it's not challenging. No, not at all. And, and well put, um, you mentioned at the start there, you know, comparative to obviously personal training, do you mm-hmm. find it to be somewhat of a challenge because you don't have that face-to-face contact a lot of the time with your clients? I think for some people, yes. Mm. I think there are people out there or there are potential clients or current clients out there that they're harder to communicate with online than they are in person. Yep. Some people aren't good online communicators. Mm. Um, and just like some coaches aren't great being online, but they're fantastic face-to-face, yes. you know? Yep. Um, so everyone's a little bit different and that's why I personally, I do both yep. because I find that some people are just, you know, they just want a face-to-face coach. They, they'll never do online coaching in their life. Yep. Some people are the opposite. They don't need that face-to-face attention. So I think both have their pros and cons. Um, I know personally when I was just doing face-to-face personal training, that's it. Yep. Um, I enjoyed it more from a perspective of I went to work, I trained my clients, and I wouldn't get much messaging or yep. requirements for communication outside of that. But for online coaching, because you don't see that person for a whole hour and you don't get that whole hour of communication in one hit, mm. um, you're going to get more messages throughout the week and more questions and whatnot. So, yeah, I think both have their pros and cons. Um, neither is better than the other, and everyone's different. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, okay. Do you find, um, as you mentioned, you know, d- depending on the, the, the person itself, like obviously as an online coach, you've still got to try and communicate with empathy you've still got to obviously provide yep. a, a high level of service to be a good one mm-hmm. um that that in itself would obviously carry some some challenges given the the type of communication is either message or email or voice message so yep. um can can the message get lost in translation due to that or can it be misconstrued do you find that happens from time to time as well yes it absolutely can um you can't necessarily hear someone's tone or feel Mm. their emotion through an email. Um, And this is something that I preach to a lot of people is if you're going to be an online coach, you've got to be a good writer. You've got to learn to be able to write so people can actually feel your communication through the email. And that's something that I always pride myself on is how I use words, how I use even simple things like exclamation points or your grammar, Mm. making people be able to almost hear you. Um, and look, if you struggle that, there's all there's also options to do, you know, video chats. There's mm. options to do videos, um, video feedback and stuff like that. So online coaching just isn't limited to email. And over my years, I've had to do, you know, a combination of many different mm. ways to communicate. Yep. You know, I've had clients that, you know, don't even speak English as a primary language. Yeah. So I've literally had to like write messages and emails using Google Translate. Yeah, well. Um, so it is actually easier for the client. Um, so yes, things can get lost in translation, but if you're an online coach and you're finding that to be an issue, mm. don't just blame the client or blame, or don't blame the system. Like just try find a way to be better. Yeah. Try find a way to better your service or create, create your service, you know, another way mm. so people can actually feel you and hear you. Yeah. Um, yeah, because you know, as an online coach, communication is literally everything. A hundred percent. And I guess we're, we're in a, um, in current times, technology is obviously quite advanced now. So like you said, you've got video, you know, AI is on our doorstep. So that yep. can probably be taken advantage of at some point. But I think you're very much right in terms of communication because things can be misunderstood or misinterpreted so Absolutely. easily. You you write in capital letters, someone thinks you're yelling at them. <laughs> you know what I mean? And like, you are. Yeah, and you are. Yeah, that's right. You are. Um, or you, your sentence is very abrupt or short yeah. and people could take offense to that. So, yeah, yeah you've got to very much manage the way you communicate and the, and the, the context in which you communicate. I, I, it, I completely agree with that. Yeah, and, it, and it's knowing about what type, like what each specific client, I guess, requires in terms of communication. Like some clients will check in and they'll give me one or two sentences. Mm. Have a good week. Yep. Those types of people don't want you know, paragraphs on paragraphs of feedback. Mm. But some people need that. Yeah. So as as a coach, it's your job to figure out what that person needs. I always say it like, figure out what makes your clients tick. Yep. Um, 
And, you know, that might mean that you have to write, you know, 500 to 1,000 word mm. feedbacks, you know. I wrote a math... I, I've, the last two days, I've had some of my busier check-in days. I do really big check-in days on Monday. Mm. Um, and, yeah, I, I'd hate to go and see how many words I write on Monday. But, yeah, yeah it's some, some people require 1,000 to 2,000 words most weeks. Wow. Um, so, yeah, just, just figure out what makes your client tick and and communicate with them that way. Mm. Everyone's different. Do you find, and I'm going slightly a tangent here, do you find it challenging uh, with all the travel, particularly of recent that you've done, and we spoke about that in length in the previous podcast, mm-hmm. the fact that you've been to America, Australia, mm-hmm. uh, multiple seasons in America, now we're over in India. Um, you know, different time zones, obviously we're on planes a lot mm-hmm. and can't communicate on planes. So. There's obviously delays. There's going to be, um, you know, delays in terms of not only getting back to people in terms of uh, feedback, but also just the fact that we're in a different time zone. Mm-hmm. Do you find that challenging? Do you put pressure on yourself to get people back, get 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 back to people quickly? Yeah, I do. That's something I um, have always pressured myself with: is making sure people receive a response or their feedback or their program updates in a yep. timely fashion. Yeah. Um, because I think that's what people like love. Yeah. Like. I know some some trainers out there, you know, make their clients wait two or three days. Mm. Um, look, if, if if the client's comfortable with that, that's fine. But yeah. personally, if that was me as the client, I wouldn't be okay with that. Mm. So I always try and put myself in the client's shoes and say, if I was a client, what would I like? You yeah, know, sure. I, I've had coaches before. Yep. Um, you know, I've done contest prep, so I've had to have coaches, and I, I know what service what level of service I require. So I try and give what I would expect mm. for what my clients pay me. Yep. Um, so yeah, there is always an element of pressure when you travel to make sure that you're on top of it. And it makes going on holidays quite challenging. Yes. Because I still try and work when I'm on holidays. Yep. Um, but I'll always be transparent with my clients and let them know that, hey, this week I'm here or this week I'm there. And that means X and Y. Yep. Um, but... I find even like, because obviously, you know, with the amount of travel that I'm required to do, sometimes I might be in multiple time zones in a space of two months. Some time zones are actually easier. Yeah. Like when I went to America, on the East Coast by about four o'clock, it was very, very, like four o'clock in the afternoon, it was very, very early in Australia. Mm. So I basically had the full day to do whatever I liked. Yeah, and then okay. I would plonk myself at the laptop at 4 p.m. and just do updates as they rolled in. Yeah, okay. Um, whereas in Australia, you know, I get up and I might already have five, six check-ins and then more roll through. So the feedback might actually take longer. So it just depends where you are. Like where we are in India right now, we're four and a half hours behind. Mm. So clients may receive their feedback at a later time. Yeah. But I generally say to my clients, like, I'll get back to you within 24 hours for formal check-ins mm. and then questions and, you know, like general messages as fast as possible. Yeah, okay. Um, but yeah, it, it, it does make it challenging when you're traveling, you're on planes for extended periods of time. But I think as long as you just let everyone know where you're at and mm. you're transparent and honest, they don't mind. Obviously, you're very successful in terms of the number of clients you've got and, and you know, the, the, the success you've had. Do you find it challenging to switch off? I don't switch off. <laughs> so I would find it challenging if, in fact, I did switch off. But I, unfortunately, like, people say, like, oh, yeah, you got to switch off, you got to switch off. It's yeah. like, do you? Do you have to? Well, and, can, and can you? That's a fair Can pe- you fair truly question. switch off? Yeah. I don't think the whole time I've been a personal trainer at all, yeah. I've gone one day where I didn't do one yeah. thing of yeah. work. Um, I don't, I, I genuinely, and I'm not saying this to try and, you know, big note myself or no. whatever. I genuinely don't remember a day in the last 10 years of my life where I didn't open my Gmail account yeah. and reply to at least one email. Yeah. Okay. Um, even before I was very busy or, you know, quote unquote successful. And I say mm. quote unquote, because I think successful is subjective or su- success yeah. is objective. I don't necessarily see myself as successful. Um, but yeah, so I, I don't, I don't really switch off and I'm not saying that to say, you know, like I'm a workhorse or whatever. Yeah. It, it's just literally like it's the nature of the beast, your right? work, your work becomes your life because you're dealing with real people. Mm. Um, and you're dealing with people that live in different time zones as well. So you might get messages at two or 3am or yeah. 11pm or middle of the day, you know, 
So I think if you've truly unplugged, uh, you probably you probably don't have a hell of a lot going on, mm. um, or you're just very 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 good at um, you know dividing work and and your personal life. <laughs> but I think that if you're truly invested as an online coach, it, it kind of just becomes your life. Mm. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I, I don't don't really switch off. Like I have periods where I try and favor work less. Yeah, okay. Um, like middle like, of the year sort of stuff, outside of the seasons, weekends More so maybe. just if I'm on a holiday. Yeah, okay. Um, the work stuff will come second to a degree. I might have some things that are pressing that I have to do, but yep. um, I'll try and, you know, go out and do stuff for myself or with my partner or friends or whoever mm-hmm. I'm with or wherever I am and then come back to the work in the afternoon. But yeah, I don't, I don't think, and I think you probably agree, you don't really ever get a chance to switch off. No. And yeah. I'm not saying poor me or anything because I, I love my job. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, it gives me the flexibility to do a lot of things that I otherwise wouldn't be able to do with a standard, you know, mm. six to two. I, like I used to be a tradie and I couldn't get anything done during the days because I was at work. You're working. Yeah. Like if I needed to go to the doctors for whatever reason, yeah. if I need to go to the dentist, if I need to go and... You know, go to the RTO and update my license, things yeah. like that. You'd never be able to do because you never get a friggin' day off Monday <laughs> to Friday, and all of those things are shut on the weekend. That's right. Um, so yeah, you got You got to take, you got to take the tough with the good and the good with the tough. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, look, I agree. Um, it, it is very challenging if you want to try and switch off. Um, I, I find it even more challenging with kids and. and oh yeah, and that that's another thing. Like I don't have kids. Yeah. Like I'm lucky. Yeah. I can't even imagine how you do it with oh, with kids and. I might look. My kids are teenagers, so and you've got a beehive. Yeah, I've got a beehive too. You know, and that and that's that's it at the top of the. We need an update list. on that, by the way. How are the bees going? <laughs> Just a quick quick segue. The, the, the quick segue. Bees are going well. They've they've worked their rings out for the last probably six months, <laughs> and the, and I've harvested all the honey. So now they've got more work to do before the next harvest. Awesome. Yeah. Put them back to work. Mate. I will put them back to work. Absolutely, they work hard. They do do work hard. <laughs> Um, but yeah, no, look, in terms of obviously, uh, my, my perspective on that, you know, having kids like they're, they're so used to it. They know, you know, all I got to say is, right, I'm doing some video feedback or I'm doing some calls or whatever, and they'll sort of stay out of my way and keep things quiet. So they're pretty good in that regard. But I, I couldn't imagine having a toddler or a kid, a, a baby run around that didn't understand those rules or didn't understand those concepts while you're trying to operate. It would be very challenging. Uh, not to mention the fact that, you know, the travel side of things obviously, um, plays another role but that's a whole other discussion but um, in regards to obviously not necessarily switching off but do you get to a point where the emotion and the investment in the job you know you get to the back end of say a comp season like we are at the moment and you, you're you, you feel I don't know exhausted mentally exhausted yeah 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 oh, 100% yeah um, yeah, you go through those phases where like you might have a very very busy period for two or three months and just by the end of it you just your head feels really heavy. Yeah. Um, you feel like you can't think straight mm. um, unless it's your work. Like yep. you, you start working and you're super sharp, and then everything outside of work, you just like, I don't even remember. <laughs> I, you know, sometimes I'm what fucking days. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, yeah. Um, like the back end of this season, I, I feel a bit better now because I, I have been overseas and I did get a week to sort of prioritize work a little bit less. Mm. Still did work, but um, yeah, towards the back end of this year, I, I've like. Personally, like I've really struggled mentally, mm. um, and I've I have said that to a few people. Um, yeah, I, I yeah probably the most I've ever struggled. Yeah, fair enough. Um, and I'll openly admit that. Um, but like I said, you want to be you want to be good at anything. Like there has to be some level of sacrifice, and you don't always have to feel like that. Yeah. Um, and you know you don't ever have to feel like that either. But you know I just got to a point where. I was really struggling and couldn't really do anything outside of work. Mm. Um, I wasn't depressed or anxious or anything. Yeah. Just, yeah, mentally I, I, I was just a little bit done with, with the comp season. So, um, yeah, you do get to those points where you might experience a little bit of burnout. Mm. And I th- sometimes I think people like try and run away from that stuff maybe a little bit too much and try and stay comfortable. Yeah. Um, I think... Again, like I keep coming back to if you want to be good at something or great at something or a champion or whatever, we spoke about it on the last podcast, um, maybe you do have to push yourself to that point. You have to push yourself to the limit. So, you know, I feel like I've certainly done that a few times. Oh, absolutely. Um, but generally, I'm, I'm pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in regards to... Oh, what was I going to say now? We got interrupted by the door. Who was it? 
<laughs> Monty can deal with that. <laughs> um, in regards to all the travel that you do, now that's obviously um, your choice to mm -hmm. travel to as many shows as you can yeah. for your clients, right? Yeah. Obviously, that takes a toll as well. Um, early mornings, late nights, just travel in general, sitting at airports, on planes is mm -hmm. quite exhausting. Mm -hmm. Do you feel, and again, going back to your original point, do you feel that's a, a contributing factor to the success of your business? And I'll say success, even though you probably <laughs> don't see it that way. Yeah. Um, because you are trying to be present at as many shows as you can? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think um, showing people that you genuinely care and that you appreciate their business and how much effort they give you, I think yep. it's important to try and give back. Yep. Um, you know, like... My clients, you know, they pay me a good amount of money and they put in the work every week. So I think they would, you know, and I certainly appreciate that. Yeah. Um, so I think you have to give something back. So obviously I can't be in, you know, 38 places at once, <laughs> um, but I do my absolute best to try and get to every single show that I can. Yeah. Um, realistically, I try and be like, if I've got a client who's in Melbourne, for example, I try to make sure I get to at least one of their shows. Yeah. They might be doing three or four shows. If if I don't if I don't get a chance to get to any, it makes me feel a bit unwell. Yes. Um, yeah, I agree and I that. feel I feel really guilty. Not they don't even care, but for me it's just like I haven't I haven't had the opportunity to show my appreciation or my gratitude or whatever. Mm. And you know, everyone's different. Like I'm not saying that you have to mm. like as a coach you have to go to these shows, but for me it's just it's a I feel like it's an opportunity for me to show my appreciation to that client, yep. to that athlete. Um, and you know, I, I, I build a, you know, I spoke about it in the last podcast, I, I really try to build a good personal relationship with all my clients. And you know, like, I'm sure they want all their friends there, so yeah, they yeah. probably want me there as well. So yeah, um, yeah I, think, I think that's probably a contributing factor because people probably see that I genuinely care. Mm. Um, and I'm not doing it to, you know, it's not a facade. Like, I genuinely do want to be at these shows. I yeah, love yeah. it. Yeah. Um, I don't go because I have to. Like, the clients don't necessarily ask me to be there. They don't pay me to be there. I go there off my own back just because I genuinely love it. It's and more because I'm there, right? Obviously. Yeah. yeah <laughs> not going for the client. <laughs> <laughs> going for the view. <laughs> um, so, I don't, I don't do it as a facade or to look good. Like, yeah. I do it because I want to be there. Um, and I think some people really, really like that. Mm. I think they love to have their coach there. So, but going back to the, and, and I, I don't mean to try and turn this into a negative thing because it's not. No, no. But but going back to the point about you know obviously being exhausted at the end of the season. Like I remember you telling me a story, and I can't remember what season it was. This is several years ago. I think you had oh clients in Townsville, <laughs> and then you had to hire a car to drive to Cairns to get a flight <laughs> to Melbourne yeah. or Sydney to be there on time yeah. the next morning. Like that's obviously a fairly significant level of commitment because mm. you may not have looked at that approach and just gone, look, I can't get a flight out, you know, I can't yeah. be there, but you've yeah. found a way, right? Yeah, so this was this was 2018 season A. Yeah. Um, so I had, I had the IC in Townsville show on the first day and then the second day on the Sunday was the AWMBS. Mm. So I think I had, you know, like four or five clients compete on the Saturday yep. at the Townsville show. It might have even been more, but then I had about fifteen on the Sunday. Yeah, right. So I, I, I did need to be there. Oh no, no, that was, it wasn't that many, but it was it was a good amount of sure. Clients. So I needed to be there. Yeah. Um, it was important that I was there. Um, so I couldn't I couldn't get a flight. Because back then, it, it's a bit different now, but back then, this was five years ago, they didn't have a flight late enough out of Townsville mm. back to Brisbane. Yep. You could only get one Sunday morning. Mm. But the problem is, is the first flight out of Townsville on the Sunday morning would only get into Brisbane about 9.30, 10 a.m. Yeah. By that point, I'd be late. There'd yep. be no point in me being there. Sure. Like, I need to be there early. Um, so, thankfully, <laughs> um, you know, Lisa and myself weren't dating at this time, okay. but... You know, we were good friends yep. and she decided, oh, well, she didn't decide, but I told her my situation. She's like, well, you know, I'll drive us back from Townsville to Cairns yep. and then you can catch the 6 a.m. from Cairns back to Brisbane, Brisbane yep. which got me back there in due time. I think it was only like a two hour flight. Mm. Um, so massive shout out to her for yeah, doing that. Absolutely. There you go. Um, that was, yeah. Yeah. So it was, it was definitely a team effort, yep. but yeah, like I had to basically 
find find some sort of whack alternate route. And I think the Townsville to Cairns drive is a good four, four and a half hours. I was going to say, it's a decent, it's a decent yeah. run, yeah. So Lisa Lisa drove to the Townsville show from Cairns to watch. She okay. wasn't competing that season. Yep. And she, she would have been there anyway. Yep. Um, but she offered to drive me back instead of driving back the next day like she usually used mm. to. Um, drove back to that, drove back that night, slept at her house for about two hours, mm. and then flew back to <laughs> Brisbane. Um, so she she clutched up big time for me there. So I really appreciate that. So caffeine was your best friend the next day. Yeah, I literally posted on my Instagram. I said, if anyone sees me, like just bring me a coffee. <laughs> don't don't ask if you're gonna ask if I want a coffee. Don't just bring it. Just bring it. Just bring it. Yeah, so, I'll drink anything. Cappuccino, yeah. mochaccino, doesn't matter. I, ha- I had forgotten about that that yeah. weekend, but yeah, that was that was wild. Yeah. Um, but so. that's like going back to your original point. Like you want to be at the majority of shows. Sometimes yeah. these are the things you've got to do to, to make it happen, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you know, it, it costs money and it takes time, but yeah. it's it's so worth it when you see your clients up on stage. You know, absolutely. you get to get to be there and pump up with them and experience all the all the fun with them because yep. it, it is a fun experience um, and you know like I know that clients love having their coaches there yeah it, yeah, it makes the experience so much more fun so it takes away a lot of nerves too right? it does yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely yeah um, in terms of your approach so obviously you know I, I, I know it reasonably well given that you coach my wife who's in the background she'll just smile and nod um but uh and 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 give me a few gestures but um you know do you find in regards to obviously coaching and having done it for such a long time that the system itself that you offer and operate from needs to be like really succinct and really streamlined and and easy to follow from a user's perspective as well can't be clunky can't be Mm. yeah yeah absolutely like I, i think I think there are so many different ways to do it, obviously, Mm. and you need to develop a system that works for your clients. Not every single person that comes to you is going to like how it's done. Yeah. um, Which is why some clients, you know, end up with different trainers. Yeah. Using different softwares and stuff. Mm. Um, But I've tried to create a an approach to my training and my check in process that suits everyone. Yep. Um, But I'm always open to manipulating a little bit for specific clients if they need it done a different way. Like if someone, for example, like I use Google Sheets a lot of, yeah. a lot of the time. If someone doesn't know how to use Google Sheets and they, they're, for back, lack of a better term, like technologically, mm. like, what's the word? Inept, struggling. Inept, struggling. <laughs> technologically know. inept. Yeah. <laughs> um, and they just can't get the hang of it. We figure something else out. Okay. Um, if someone requires, you know, Zoom call check-ins as opposed to an email check-in and they prefer to actually communicate by voice. We can do that. Um, So as a coach, you sometimes just got to be willing to bend your processes a little bit. You don't have to do it all the time. Mm. And you should always try and get everyone on the same page. But, you know, like like I said earlier, you know, you've got to be flexible sometimes. You know, not everyone's the same. No, they're not. Um, But like, like I've been doing this for a long time and I feel like I've got my my process is down to a to a pretty fine mm. you know um art so to speak um but like i said not not everyone loves it not everyone is good at following that process either so sometimes they don't get the most out of it yeah um but you know you, you can only do so much well I guess. that's it when you're working with large amounts of people everyone's different but yeah. speaking of that how important is it in terms of customization you know obviously as you mentioned, everyone's different. Everyone's got a different approach on things. Everyone operates differently. Everyone structures things differently. Their worlds are different. You've obviously got to filter and customize your approach, the program and the nutrition, everything mm-hmm. to the specific person. You can't just cut and paste, right? No, you can't. Um, I get that there's, <laughs> it's tempting to yeah. do copy and paste because it would theoretically be a lot quicker. Yes. And I know a lot of people would do it. Yeah. Um, but for me, like, I understand that sometimes people require a similar approach, mm. if not the exact same approach, but that doesn't mean that's where you start. No. Um, you know, you don't know how someone's going to respond. Like this person on paper might require, you know, 2,500 calories, five days of training and two days of cardio. Mm. But then, you know, the theory doesn't match up with the practicality. And you're like, hmm, this person might be a bit of an outlier. Mm. Um like your wife sitting over there. She's def- <laughs> she's definitely an outlier. Like on paper, yeah. she should respond to a certain intake, a certain level of expenditure. She just doesn't. Yep. 
Um, so we have to do things a little bit differently. Yep. But you don't know that until you set up the plan and get some sort of baseline. Like I had a client ask me a question the other day. So, you know, like what, what's our plan going forward? I'm like, the first 10 to 14 days, we're going to collect data yeah. and create some level of baseline. And then we adjust the plan from there. If the plan's working the way we want it to straight off the bat, great, we mm. keep going. Um, but this 10 to four, first 10 to 14 days or even three to four weeks, yeah. you know, take it with a grain of salt. Don't necessarily be invested in the result, be invested in the process. Um, and then take the data from that and make the necessary adjust, adjustments yeah. to move in the direction you want to move in. Um, Control your patience too, I suppose. That's yes. Probably, that's probably a yes. tough factor. Yes, be patient. People say life's short, but it's probably the longest thing you'll ever do. So, <laughs> we, got, we, we got time. We got yeah, time we do have here. time. We do have time. Oh dear. Um, okay, so the like the online coaching space is obviously well, it's heavily saturated as we know, and then, and it's not just what we do in terms of fitness. You know, there's there's life coaches and there's health coaches and there's, oh, there's everything. Um, it's heavily unregulated. We know mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. But from your opinion, how important is it, particularly for fitness and health, when we're dealing with people's health, that you do have supporting qualifications and obviously, you know, off the back of that experience in mm-hmm. terms of dealing with what we deal with. Yeah, I think I think it's everything. Yeah. Right? Like you don't know what you don't know. So yeah. I think that there's uh, there should be a requirement and you know, like companies like Sports Nutrition Australia are working really hard on trying to create mm-hmm. legislations and constant upskilling for this kind of stuff. Yep. Um and you know, having like registered members um, CPD and that kind of stuff, which yep. I think is great. Mm. Um, not everyone is going to do it, no. unfortunately. You can't you can't control people. Like you can't tell them that hey, you have to do this. Yeah. People are still going to do it unregulated. Um, we, we we don't have control over that, but you don't know what you don't know. And the the fitness industry, in particular nutrition, um, the data is showing new things year after year after year, um, like. Let's, let's look at something like L-carnitine, for example. Mm. Like, theoretically, like, you look at what L-carnitine should do. Yeah. It's like a wonder supplement. Mm. But in practicality, when you ingest it orally, it's only, like, the bioavailability is so low mm. that it's practically useless. Yep. But, you know, you wouldn't know that if you didn't actually look into the data or do any research or do any courses that taught you that. Yep. Um, so I, th- I think it's very, very important to have some sort of regulation around something like this, like, especially when people start getting hurt. Like, yeah, yeah. sometimes people have, like, trainers themselves or nutrition, you know, what's the, what's the word? Um, self, self-entitled nutritionists, like, giving okay. themselves the title of yeah, yeah, nutritionist. Yeah, yeah. They actually have good intentions. Yeah. Like, people say, like, oh, this coach is terrible or you know, they're doing dumb stuff. It's like, sometimes people like are actually not doing it because they're lazy. Like (laughs) sometimes people genuinely think they're doing the right thing. Um, which is why I don't call anyone stupid or dumb. Like some people just don't know. Yeah. Um, and they actually end up hurting people and tarnishing their reputation very early on in their career as a result. So if I could give like one bit of advice is like go do some courses and actually get qualified. So you know what is and isn't acceptable. Yeah. Um, that way you're actually be, you're, you'll actually be able to deliver your clients a good service and, you know, keep their health intact. Yeah. Um, and you'll be able to upskill along the way and not destroy your reputation. Yeah. And, you know, like over the last, you know, four or five years, people have been caught out for doing dumb stuff. Uh-huh. Um, you know, like clients are starting to, you know, realize what they should and shouldn't be getting. Yes. Um, people are becoming more educated because the nutrition and training industry is getting so much bigger. Mm. And that's probably a result of bodybuilding Yeah. Um, because it's become so popular. So more and more people that aren't coaches are doing their research. And when they go to a coach, they go, hmm, this doesn't seem right. Yeah. And then they ask questions and then they realize the person may not fully understand or know what they're doing. So... Um, you know, people people know what they should be getting now. So I think it's very, very important from a business sense, but also just protecting your ass because if you get sued, that's going to cost you a lot of money. Oh, yeah. And if you're not insured, it's going to cost even more money. Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, get, get get qualified, get <laughs> registered, and get insured. Like, I can't stress it enough. In regards to that, like, obviously, the, the client doing their research or, or understanding what's right and wrong, who, who's... 
I suppose it's a shared responsibility, right? Mm-hmm. Like the coach obviously needs to be needs to know what they need to know, yeah. but the client also needs to ask the right questions before yeah. they engage someone. Yeah, yeah. The client has a level of responsibility in doing their research. Yeah. Um, you know, we. I think I mentioned it on the lo- the last podcast, or it was it was either on the last podcast we did or another podcast I did recently. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we hear about all these horror stories and the clients, you know, taking the coaches to the cleaners and say like, they did this and they did that. It's like, okay, like I understand that. I'm really sorry you had a poor experience, but did you do your research? Well, no, I just I just went to old mate down the road because this bloke in the gym. Yeah, what, it was the last podcast. Oh, yeah. It, yeah. Old mate in the gym just said, go down to this bloke. Yeah. And it's like, dude, you know, you have to take a level of responsibility 100%. to ensure that you ask the right questions, mm. you research, you ask around, like, you know, find people that are being coached by someone you're interested in and, and ask them questions. Reach out to the coach and ask questions, yeah. get some information or have a call. You know, like, a lot of the time coaches offer free, obligation free, like, consults, financially yeah. free consults. Yeah. Like, I know that I don't charge someone to, you know, email me and ask me for my coaching information. Like. Yeah. I'll say, hey, this is what the coaching includes. Yeah. If you have any more questions, yeah. let's jump on a call. Yeah. And we'll do a consult. Yeah. Um, so the client definitely has to share a level, share a level of response, or share a bit of that responsibility in mm. that process. But the coaches are obviously in control of the plan. Yes. Like, and we all expect our clients to do what we prescribe. Mm. So if you're a coach who's uneducated and you're telling your clients to do something. They're under pressure to do it because they're paying for the service, so they're gonna do it. Absolutely. Um, so I think I think there has to be some level of sh- sharing that responsibility, but ultimately, you know, coaches should just be qualified and insured, and you know, yeah. be be qualified to do their job. You know, like everyone who wants to work on a car needs to go through an apprenticeship. Hundred percent. I think there should be some level of that. Like I know that there is some level of that, but I still think it's probably too easy to be qualified mm. as a nutritionist. Obviously, with contest prep, there's no regulation around that. Nope. Um, and that's something that I know there's a couple of bodies trying to create a course around, mm. which I think is fantastic. Yep. Um, because that's where a lot of people get hurt, is the extreme dieting side of things. Um, Big Because time. people have whack ideas. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, yeah, th- there's got to be, there's gotta be a, a level of responsibility taken by mm. the client and by the coach. You know, I'm not going to... I'm not gonna, if I'm gonna build a house, I'm not gonna not do my research. I'm not gonna go Absolutely. to the first builder that I see on Google. And it's it, well, that's it, you're investing. You're yeah. investing in yourself, so. Yeah. And social media is an endless resource. Go on their Instagram, go on their clients' Instagrams, yeah. go on Facebook forums, mm. like, don't go on Reddit. Reddit is stupid. <laughs> don't it's use Reddit, bit. because it's anonymous, it's <laughs> dangerous, it's like a shark's pool. Yeah. Don't go on Reddit, but that. <laughs> there are heaps of public places you can go to do your research. Mm. So yeah, if you if you're a prospective client, yeah, maybe do better. Yeah, well that's it. You know, if you go, like you said, if you go to engage a builder, if you go to engage a lawyer, if you if you go to um, you know seek out a professional in some capacity, mm-hmm. why why not apply the same approach to a coach? Yeah, and don't don't always follow the money either. Like, if you go to someone who's cheap, yeah, like. The quote is like, if you think it's cheap to hire an uh, to hire, uh, no, if you think it's expensive to hire a professional, yeah, wait until you hire an amateur. Yes, that's I don't, exactly. I don't, I don't know like how relevant that is in the space of coaching. But if you go to a cheap mechanic mm. and they completely destroy your car, <laughs> then you're going to have to pay even more for a professional yeah. to fix it. It generally does end up being the same as coaching. Like if you go to a a coach who's unqualified, uneducated and they put you through your, the ringer and they absolutely destroy you and you end up with hormonal like issues, you end up with digestive issues, mm. you might have to go to an endocrinologist, that's expensive. You yep. might have to end up going to a dietitian. that's expensive. Yep. And worst of all, you might have to go to a psychologist. Yeah. And that's very common. Oh yeah. That is very expensive. Yes, so, and hard to get into too. Yeah. yeah, so don't always just go with whoever's the most financially feasible. Like I understand that money's different for everyone mm. and I'm not sitting here saying you should hire the most expensive no. coach, but don't let like what someone charges be the first priority. It shouldn't be the first question you ask either. No. I know I, I do get that from time to time. How much are you? That if, if that's the first question, then maybe 
the, the coaching isn't your priority at oh, this yeah. point in time. Most people who like start with that question yeah. very rarely follow up yeah. because they're not actually interested in having a good coach. No. They're just curious on what how much it's going to cost them. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, exactly right. Uh, all right. Um, look, I think we've touched on everything. I, I really don't have much more to add. That was really good. I guess, I guess the point of this podcast was to, to sort of delve into the online coaching space and obviously, you know, pick your brain in particular mm-hmm. and show... You know, not from a negative standpoint by any means, but yeah. just show that it, it is hard work. It, it's not yeah. bells and whistles. You're not sitting by a pool. You're not, you know, no. the, tra- the travel may be there and the flexibility may be there, but you've still got to work your ring out to be, you know, obviously really good at what you do. You still got to carry a level of professionalism. Your communication has to be really, really good. And obviously, you know, what we just spoke about, your systems and your qualifications need to support what you do. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And. I guess one last thing to add is like a coaching relationship is like teamwork. Mm. Um, you know, like very rarely do you see like a sports team with one really, really good player yeah. carry a team of bums to a championship. Like it just doesn't happen. You're yeah. going to get beat by someone better. Yeah. Um, so you have to work really, really hard together and one person might have to pick up the slack for another in one department sure. and vice versa. So, you know, yes, we're coaches and... You know, we have the wheel, but we're we're humans too. Mm. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, it's Just, a, it, it, it's a two way street. It's it, it, you're, you're right. You build a relationship, and while you know many many a person might not think that the relationship should get too close in terms of the time you spend together or what but that's just a byproduct of of what happens if you're successful and the relationship grows you know yeah and then there's obviously an element of trust that goes into that too yeah for sure Um, yeah so i think that's it mate i think we've covered everything that's good awesome so once again done you bud yeah done you bud (laughs) and uh I, I have an idea for a third, so I might even grab you for a third before uh, before time runs out. Beautiful. Uh, Wait, we've got nothing but time, baby. Well, so. that's it. We've got nothing but time. We've got Until Friday. It's, yeah, yeah. Then, it's, then it's all guns blazing. Yeah. Um, and it's going to be one hell of a show. I know that. Oh, yeah. Good way to finish off. So oh, yeah. thank you once again, Joe. Really appreciate your time. And no um, Instagram, as always, Joey Cantlin PT. Yep. And uh, yeah, obviously follow along if you're uh, if you're keen. Hit him up if you're keen for a coach because you you couldn't get a better one. So we'll leave it on that. And uh, thank you once again, mate. Appreciate it. All right. Once again, I'd like to thank Joey for his time. Uh, we are obviously in India working, and uh, you know not only working for IC in India, but also we've still got our businesses running at home. So I do appreciate his time, but also his candid nature and honesty and transparency in talking about you know some of his struggles with uh, with online coaching. It's um, it's certainly not an easy gig. It's one that we both really really love and are very passionate about, but. As you could hear in the podcast, it does tend to take its toll from time to time. So some good advice for anyone potentially entering the space or thinking about it or even you know have been in it for a little bit of time. Um, definitely some home truths there. So look, if you want to follow along, uh, obviously follow Joey on Joey Cantlin PT on Instagram. I'm obviously Paul's Body Engineering on Instagram. Uh, if you've enjoyed this podcast, please screenshot and share it. Tag both myself and Joey. And of course, if you're interested in any of my coaching services, please jump on paulsbodyengineering.com or click on the link in my bio on my Instagram. Now, as I say to every client, every single day, all around the world, have a great day.